Hello, everybody. Um, and welcome. Uh, I'm John Mooney. I am the founding editor of NJ Spotlight. And this has been quite a wild day, starting with an earthquake. Um, so we thank you all and, and certainly wish anybody who um, was facing consequences from it beyond just sort of being freaked out a little bit. Um, but uh, thank you very much for joining. Uh, welcome back to our change talks. Uh, we have, um, for those who have not been here before, uh, these talks uh, come out of stories that we did, uh, we were doing for a project aptly called the Change Project that's really looking at some intractable problems in New Jersey and uh, that many of us as reporters have been covering for many years. And what are some, uh, not necessarily solutions, but some uh, some signs of progress and, and areas of, of best practice uh, in addressing them? Uh, it, it is certainly coming at it from a solutions lens. Um, and we started this a few months back looking at maternal health and, and a program that brings nurses uh, into homes of, of new families. Uh, then we did a project, um, John Reitmeyer, on our state budget and some reforms that make it more transparent and accountable. Uh, and now we're here talking about hunger and food insecurity and uh, the food relief system that is out there um, doing really heroic work in, in trying to address it and, and the things that work in that effort um, and the challenges and the barriers, um, because um, you know it, it, it is terribly hard work, obviously. The way this is gonna work, and we have a, a panel of guests, all of which were uh, in part or, or in full involved in this project. Um, we will, I'll, I'll start some conversation among them. They know a lot more than I do about both the needs uh, facing our, our communities and then also some of the things that they've they've really uh, seen some progress with. Uh, many of you submitted questions as part of the registration and we'll try to integrate those topics into the conversation. There's also opportunity in the chat uh, to talk among yourselves and there's a Q and A where also you can pose questions. And again, we won't get to all of them, um, but we hopefully can uh, at least address some of the broader themes that are raised. Um, we will also put in the chat links to both the project we've been doing as well as uh, you know um, some coverage that we've given uh, to these topics, uh, but also an opportunity for folks. I know uh, looking at the list of people who've signed up, there's a lot of really you know connected folks to that. If there are resources you want to put into that chat that others can uh, also download, I think that's part of it's it's the new age networking that we have now uh, with these webinars. Um, we have with us to talk about this uh, John Hurdle our contributing writer who was the author of the report, um, looking at this a week ago. And uh, I'm gonna talk, you know, has been doing a lot of uh, work for Spotlight over the years and knows a lot about um, a lot of issues, but we're gonna focus in, he has been covering hunger and food relief for uh, several years, if not even longer. And, and I wanna sort of talk to him about how we, how we got here. Um, also with us, uh, Mark Dingson, did I pronounce that right? I hope. Um, Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> he's got a long, a long, a long title, but um, I, I'm calling him the state's food czar. Um, I don't know if that quite works, uh, but he is uh, the advocate um, on programs to serve these communities and these folks and these families, um, and so um, bringing the perspective of of the state's role in addressing this, and it's. A very unique position, I, I believe, it, as the report, as as John reported, the only such position in the in the country. Um, I see some nodding of heads. So, uh, I'd, I'd love to talk about how that came about and and how it can be even be expanded. And Elizabeth McCarthy of the community, uh, I'm sorry, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, uh, the largest food bank in in, in New Jersey, uh, you know, serving countless. Um, uh, pantries and food kitchens and and you know really at 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 the at the hub of the wheel in a lot of ways uh in doing this and with long experience in it I'd, I'd love to get your ideas of how we got here and and really what are some of the next steps that are needed in the in the relief effort new jersey is often touted as being a real leader here but there's obviously still food deserts and there's still families that are um, you know, going through real struggles. So I'd love to talk about going into the future. But John, let's, you and I have known each other a few years. Uh, this was a different kind of project for us at NJ Spotlight. 
uh, where we were really looking through a solutions lens at, at some of these challenges. Um, and I approached all of our reporters, what are some of the things you want to write about? What are some of the things you've been dealing with for a long time and, and deserve this kind of attention? And this was one of yours. It was, uh, I think, topping the list. T talk a little bit about how you chose to do this and, and, and the work that went into it, and then we can talk about your findings. Well, uh, thanks, John. I, I think the uh, my uh, my interest in uh, food insecurity in New Jersey probably began in the pandemic, uh, and uh, there, at that point, uh, a lot of, of food pantries which had had previously um, uh, invited uh, their clients into their premises to uh, to to select food items or to pick up uh, prepackaged. Uh, pre-packed uh, bags of food uh, suddenly couldn't couldn't do that and so they uh, so they were forced to um, uh, distribute their food out of doors and so and so there were uh, and this was fairly early on in the pandemic I, I, let's say in the in the spring of 2020 uh, and so there were big events uh, at various places uh, where people, uh, where where clients, pe people who wanted food aid, uh, would uh, would drive their cars up, hundreds of cars in many cases, uh, into into the uh, the designated location, and they would pop their trunks, and then an army of volunteers uh, would uh, would load uh, prepacked boxes and bags of food uh, into those trucks, and so obviously minimizing uh, any contact that. Uh, that people would have uh, for each other as the as the pandemic was was really beginning to rage, and so I I, I covered a few of these uh, events. There was one in particular in um, uh, Mount Laurel that I remember, um, and um, uh, you know uh, walking up and down, chatting with folks who are waiting in their cars, looking at the uh, dozens and dozens, perhaps hundreds. I don't really remember of cars that were waiting there. Um, and a, a, as a gauge of the, uh, um, you know, obviously surging demand at that particular time. Um, and uh, so I think that had an effect on me. And so so I and I believe that one of the the uh, the, the food bank that was uh, that supplied much of the food to that Mount Laurel event uh, was the food bank of South Jersey. Uh, and so I got in touch with them and I kind of developed a relationship. Uh, and uh, and so so that led me on to, um, uh, you know, trying to consider the uh, uh, the bigger picture. And I guess the you know, the latest evidence of that is is the story that we're talking about now. Yeah. And if, if for those and we put up a link to the, the piece that John uh, did and also there's a sidebar um he did on a on a at, at a couple of uh, pantries um really on the ground there but the broader piece also looking at, at um you know sort of the the overview of it and and the overall numbers and clearly there you know words was an increasing uh, demand around uh the pandemic and and really brought it to light i mean as a journalist these these issues and probably uh elizabeth you say it hasn't gotten enough attention until then but uh, it certainly, you know, that was like, oh my gosh, um, and and it became a, a major part of the story we were covering. I mean, talk a little bit about that, Elizabeth. I, um, how much it was a, pan, a a turning point of sorts, or or not? I mean, these issues are are not new to the pandemic by any means, as we well know. But talk about sort of how how we got here, and from your perspective, how much that pandemic really did bring these issues to the fore. I think the pandemic's shown a light on all of those issues for sure. Um, it certainly impacted people of lower income much more than um, people who were, you know, got unemployment or who had other ways to work remotely. Um, and so I think for the for maybe the first time for some people that they really saw just how acute the need is and how much people really are living on the margin. How many people are, you know, really just making it paycheck to paycheck and a disruption to that had major life consequences for people. I think what surprises people is that the need has not gotten back to normal, um, whatever that is. And, and it probably shouldn't be surprising since we know that in the financial crisis of 2008, it really took a good 10 years for people to fully recover. 
um, because even though they might be back at work, they probably spent a lot of their savings. They're not in as you know stable a financial situation. We know that a huge number of Americans cannot withstand even a four hundred dollar emergency. Um, and so when when we see that happen, it, it almost shouldn't be surprising that need has not only stayed the same, but if anything, has increased since the pandemic, since some of those government supports are not present anymore. Yeah, and and our our numbers now. Um... Have we been ever been at these kinds of numbers in terms of demand and and folks that you've been serving? Uh, no, I think that you know there's about over eight hundred thousand New Jerseyans who are food insecure. Um, and since it's been tracked, I believe that is probably the highest number. Um, Two hundred thousand of whom are children. Um, it really it's, it's a pretty dire state. <laughs> yeah, Mark, talk about you know this how how your job got created and 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 you know what led us here and and the needs that we faced. Yeah, thank you, John. And it's really good to be with, uh, with all of you and everybody here. I, you know, I'll admit to, um, to you, to the three of you and to everybody that's on here as we're talking about the pandemic in 2020. My my heart is literally aching and my body is reacting, I'm because I'm thinking about my old team. You know, 30 of the most amazing heroes I've ever served alongside, and how in 2020. We used to say, like, why are we out here? We're not soldiers. We're not emergency workers. We're not first responders. Why? What are we even doing here? And we were scared. Um, and, you know, and I remember I also used to tell my team all the time, we just have to hold on for another year. We just have to hold on for another year. We just have to hold on for another year. And I remember, uh, John, I was giving an interview. Um, that's when I actually first met John Hurdle is in the middle of all this craziness. And um I remember talking to somebody and I said, if we're really afraid of what's happening in 2020, what we should really be worried about is 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, to Elizabeth's point. And so, John, in the middle of all of that, I caught wind of the fact that, um, you know, one of our strongest champions for food security, um, Speaker Coughlin, was working with um, one of the most amazing partners um, in food security, Governor Murphy, to create the legislation to create my office. Um, and it's the only food security um, advocacy office in the country that's placed in the highest level of state government. I want to shout out my amazing food security colleagues um, and advocates, food security advocates, Pittsburgh, Seattle, New York City, amazing. But this is the only office that, um, um, you know, reports to the governor. And John, I was signing all of the petitions to create this office. You need to create it. You need to create it. And then randomly got a phone call one night in April, 2022, are you interested in running the office? Um, and um, that's when I said, I, I would like to take the opportunity to try and move the needle from, from, from this vantage point. So that's how this office came to be. And that's how I came to be here. And can you give a sense in any of you and John's reporting includes some of it, you know, this population, the 800,000 people, I mean, obviously it's a very diverse and, uh, you know, lots of elements to it, but maybe not necessarily as everybody has, you know, might guess, um, you know, talk a little bit about who these people are and, and you know, the and the challenges they're facing. John, if you well, want to... What... One of the things that that uh, that stood out for me in in my reporting on this story was uh, that uh, and and maybe this is something that I heard from you, Elizabeth. I can't remember, but it's but um, <clears throat> but the um, many of the people of the uh, folks who uh, of the clients of food pantries now uh, are the working poor, uh, and 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 they are and and so these are these are not the sort of uh, disheveled unemployed unemployed maybe homeless people that may exist in the public imagination but these are just these are regular folks uh who have jobs perhaps they have multiple jobs uh but but they need help with food because their income just doesn't doesn't cover everything they need to buy it. um and so that is that's what i was hearing from um uh uh from various folks during the uh during the reporting of this is it, Elizabeth, is that true? I mean, in terms of your own? Absolutely. I mean, it's 
we have you know people who are requesting evening hours, weekend hours. Um, really, we need to have accessibility for people who are you know often living paycheck to paycheck and can't just make it to the next paycheck. Um, because we have an acronym for everything in these fields, it's um, there's something called ALICE, which is asset limited, income constrained, employed, and that is often who we are seeing on our lines. Um, that people are, you know, as John said, sometimes working two jobs, but it's just wages have not kept up with the cost of things. Um, and New Jersey is an expensive place to live, as we all know. This, yeah, we this say, reminds yeah. me of a con. I'm sorry, John. Yeah, no, that's, sorry. Uh, it, it reminds me of a conversation that I had with uh, Caroline Lake, who's the executive director of a uh, food pantry out in uh, in Morris Plains, and she yeah. said that that quite a few of her clients are are living on uh, on forty to fifty thousand dollars a year uh, and she said that there's a big gap between that and uh and the estimated eighty thousand dollars a year that you need just to sort of take care of the basics in morris county and, and you know i think something that we really have to emphasize john and elizabeth to the, to the points that you guys are saying uh, when we talk about food security, right, we have to be talking about all of us. There, there's a lot of othering that happens when we talk about, you know, who who's going to food pantries and who is poor, right? But there's a huge difference between seeing a poor person and a person living in poverty, right? You're seeing a poor person, you're trying to change a person, but you're seeing a person living in poverty, you're you're trying to evaluate a situation and what got them there. And I think so much about all the people that my team, my old team and I would work with, who would literally say, "Do you know that I have a master's? Do you do you know do you know that that I'm working? Do you know that I'm a nurse? I'm a teacher, right?" And and for everybody that's listening here, I think I I would personally love to emphasize, like, yeah, this is us, guys. It's not it's not them, right? This is this is New Jersey. Um, this is us, and there is there are more of us now that need help. Um, than ever before. It's not on the news. Those lines of cars in front of all our, um, you know, organizations are are not on the front pages of newspapers anymore, John. But all of these organizations, these front line, frontliners, some of you are on this call, so shout out to all of you. They are seeing way more people now than they were at the height of the pandemic. Yep. Let me add one quick one question from the audience was on uh, 65 and older. Um, how many New Jersey residents 65 and older are food insecure? Are they a, a large chunk of this um, of, of this 800,000? Can you do we have any numbers or, or breakdowns? I, I'll take I'll take that one. Um, so I think the the updated numbers that Elizabeth is referencing, right? So food insecurity went up from 7.4% in New Jersey in 2020 to 8.8% in 2022. Those just came out. And so it's going to take um, New Jersey systems a little bit longer to extrapolate um, what those numbers look like. But it should come out, John, in, in the next couple of months. In but the past? I mean, I'm guessing but, that... But seniors are one of the fastest growing oh, populations of people. Children and seniors. Growth. Children, yeah, and, children and seniors and and you know seniors are on limited incomes right this was this was a big thing um in 2020 for all the documentaries that would um you know come to kumak to film and would, would want to cover this we all covered seniors because um you know our our seniors have our they have fixed incomes right and so it's, it was incredibly difficult it, you know if i may too john the other thing i just want to emphasize right and you and Elizabeth, um, you know, pointed this out. These problems are not new. What I used to tell people, and I still continue to tell people, is that the pandemic just burned away every ugly curtain and every poker face that any of us had to when we would see these problems and go, yeah, there are problems, right? So those curtains are gone now. And so, you know, here we are. So just, just one other anecdote that comes to mind, which kind of bears out uh, the point that um, that Mark just made, is that uh, during during the uh, the course of the reporting, I went to a um, a food pantry in Merchantville near uh, near near Cherry Hill, and there was a lady there uh, who was uh, uh, had been coming to the food pantry for a few months, uh, and um, and she had she started coming because she was between jobs, and it turned out that her job uh, she was a middle school math teacher, so this is a professional person. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a single parent, uh, and uh, and she uh, she just needed help 
during this uh, during this period. Now she she's since started her new job, but she's continuing to come to 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 that food pantry because she's trying to juggle a lot of stuff in her life. Um, but uh, you know, it's I, I think this bears out the point that you know the these people are they they these are regular folks. These are not people who are kind of way down on their luck. They're just these are regular folks. Yep. Um, so talk a little bit about, I mean, another question deals with, you know, where's the federal government in all this? Um, and I guess, and I, and I could use it as well, and, and John or, or Mark, talk a little bit, give, give a quick primer of, of how, the, how the food system or food relief system works, the different prongs of it, be it national, uh, state, uh, schools, certainly, um, then the private network and the, you know, can you give a, a, a quick rundown of how New Jersey system works uh, for those who may not know all the intricacies, obviously a lot of people do, but for, you know, for, for the rest of us, a, a quick lesson on that, Mark, if you want to. That's a deep question, John. Uh, how yeah. much time do we have for this? Two well, what hours? is basic, <laughs> What is the structure of it even? And and then we can get to how do we improve on upon it, but I, I just even that basics. Uh, yeah. So which way, which way should we go on that? Um, I will try and, and simplify, and then perhaps if you, if anybody, if John Hurdle, um, you guys make it make it very hard. You're both John, so right. Yeah. So if John Hurdle and Elizabeth, if you guys want to um, jump in, so I'll give you John my perspective on where we are now, especially because you started with where is the federal government um, in all of this. And that's one of the questions from the audience too. Yeah, I I will say that from my perspective. This is probably one of the greatest times of opportunity um, for food security work, um, starting at the federal level, um, because you have the White House and the CDC Foundation talking about um, food and nutrition security, right? And you have them hosting events and you have uh, the White House challenge to end hunger and build healthier communities, of which New Jersey, by the way, is one of only three states um, state-run initiatives that's actually in there. Um, and, and Senator Booker is very active. Um, his office is very active in engaging with me and saying, hey, what are we what are we doing about this? And those conversations that I have with the USDA and the at the federal level uh, with Senator Booker's office, it's a lot about nutrition security and um, food as medicine programs has come up a lot. Um, the federal aid to our food banks, like through the TFAP program has come up a lot. That's where the federal government is on that. And then on the state level, what I'm seeing is a very exciting time where uh, the governor's office and the policy team actively engage with me and my team to say, hey, tell us all about your research and evaluation work and what are we seeing? And we can get into you know, what that looks like and how we're identifying gaps. But you know, on the state level, state side as well, I will share with everybody the thing that makes me incredibly excited. Um, two new assembly committees, right? There's one committee on children, families, and food security. It's the first time in my career I've ever heard of a, a, you know, an assembly committee on, you know, children, families, and food security. And then there's another one on economic mobility, commerce, um, and agriculture, right? So I think that's where our state is on that. And then you've got re at the county and nonprofit level, I'm incredibly excited out of our 21 counties. I'm I'm out, you know, in New Jersey a lot. There's at least 12 counties with multi-sector county level coalitions. Elizabeth and her team participated in some of these uh, where people are really coming together to try and say, how do we do this? And they're actively saying, Mark, how can we make sure we're doing this from a trauma-informed community-driven perspective? Um, so that might have been a little long-winded, but that's what I see in terms of what the structure looks like right now. And, and talk about the nonprofit uh, side of this, um, Elizabeth, and 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 that structure and and what's out there. How many uh, communities do you serve, and how many families? So we actually we serve fifteen out of the twenty one counties in New Jersey, and we have over eight hundred partners, which means soup kitchens, pantries, um, really um, child feeding programs, and after school programs, and in the summer. Um, so it's a very extensive network um, of amazing providers. Um, that said, it's probably not, if you were going to design a food distribution system today, you wouldn't design the one that we have most likely because it grew organically over, you know, our, our food bank is celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. This was something that really started, you know, a famous story in the back of our founder's station wagon. Um, and so people have risen to meet the challenge. 
I think our challenge now is to make that system more efficient, to figure out the best distribution model. So we're really looking at the data, the community by community data about food insecurity and saying, okay, wh who are we delivering to there? Do they maybe have more capacity if that's a neighborhood that you know doesn't have enough um, food right now? Are there other places where maybe we're a little saturated with providers and we wouldn't take any new providers there? Um, is there a hub and spoke model we could start to look at? Like really kind of digging into our distribution model um, and seeing if there are things we can do to make sure we're getting food to the people who really you know, who need it, the communities and people who need it the most. I have two questions off of that. One is, how do you define a food desert uh, for those who may not? Um, I mean, is, is it a, my, a, you know, a mileage thing or, or at least? Well, it's really about access to healthy food. So you might live, you know, next door to a food store, but if it doesn't have produce or things like that. So it's a place that people do not have um, consistent, accessible access to healthy food. And you, you said if you were to design a, a food distribution system now, you wouldn't necessarily do it this way. How would you do it? I mean, I guess I'm <laughs> I didn't mean to imply that I wouldn't use I know, the partners. I know. Yeah, because the partners I, I are that great. It's that you wouldn't necessarily have 800 partners spread around, some of whom you know, are doing the best they can, but are open maybe two hours a month on a Saturday. And it's a church. And they need to be part of it, because those are trusted places where people will go to, to get food. So I am not suggesting that they shouldn't be part of the distribution network, but that maybe there's a way to build capacity in that area with more refrigerated space, which better you know, conditions. Because as we've tried to provide healthier food, you know, over a third of what we provide is produce, um, proteins, people need different infrastructure for that, right? This is not a food kitchen you might be thinking of from years ago, a pantry with cans on the shelves. These are, there's, there is some, we need some shelf stable things, but we also really need healthy food. And so that really changes that the needs of who our part, what our partners have. And what was the number of food, I think it was in your story, John, of food deserts or healthy food deserts? Uh, yeah, well, there according to the uh, Economic Development Authority, there are fifty food de uh, fifty food deserts in New Jersey, uh, and and they um, so that was a number that they came up with a couple of years ago, uh, and and they define it. Uh, it's partly in terms of um, of the availability of any food. So if there's not a supermarket within a certain area, then uh yeah. th then that would be one of the things that makes a, a town a food desert but uh but they're also talking about um uh if if uh, as elizabeth said if uh healthy food isn't available at that supermarket or or if if uh it's if an area if if the the nearest supermarket is just too far away and that, that there's no uh, there's no public transit to get there, uh, then then that would also kind of feed into the definition. So the EDA is uh, is is looking at ways of uh, of cutting back on that number, obviously. I mean, as, as part of your reporting, you wanted to look at things that, you know, um, that were common in, in practices that work. And Elizabeth started talking about some of the specifics of that. What are, you know, what are others that you found, John, that are sort of the key components to some effective practices, both as you've seen them in practice, and we can talk about other states that have done this as well, but also what you've seen here. I, I remember you ran through a, a bunch of them, and I'm yeah. Uh, repeat well, those. Well, well, well. One of the things that I was hearing from folks in the system, in, including uh, Mark and Elizabeth, uh, is is the uh, an increasing emphasis on collaboration between uh, between members of the food aid community. Uh, and people who run services that are that are seen as being related and so those re those uh, services might be uh, related to housing or mental health or drug abuse or so, or uh, and, and a host of other things um and uh, i mean going back to the the, the food pantry out in uh, in morris plains for example uh, i mean that is part of a coalition of organizations uh, which have about uh, more around about three dozen um, three dozen groups uh, taking care of of uh, that uh, that take take care of um, you know related services and and what people will tell you increasingly is is uh, well you know if if we the food pantry can't immediately uh, take care of your needs uh, then we probably know somebody who can and so there's there's just an increasing uh, emphasis on that. Has that, yeah, talk about Elizabeth, talk about that a little bit. Has that, has that changed over the years? 
Yeah, and it's so important. And some so many of our partners are doing that incredibly well, having wraparound services um, so that someone, yes, the immediate problem they're coming to for is food, but usually that means there's a lot of other things. Um, so we have teams that can go out and help people um, apply for SNAP, for example. And so we're co-located at a lot of our partners. Some of our partners do that work also. Um, many of them, uh, where Mark used to work, Kumac, you know, has people there who are really case managing um, people, really helping with anything. If they need to get, you know, heat assistance or rental assistance, connecting them with the right places, whenever possible, co-locating those is just amazing. Um, we just opened one pantry in Newark, right upstairs from St. Barnabas, um, a health a health clinic. So if someone gets diagnosed with diabetes or heart disease, they can go right upstairs meet with a nutritionist and go home with food that will actually help them now with their health and set them kind of on that right track. So I think more and more anywhere we can co-locate um, as many services as possible is absolutely the models that we think are just wonderful and most helpful, most impactful. Mark, is, what's the state's role? And I mean, imagine this is a significant part of your job is helping, helping these uh, things come together, these networks, but what is the state's role with that? Sure. Um, so I had one very clear marching order from the governor, which is, hey, man, move the needle on food security. Um, and I had one um, uh, very powerful statement from the speaker that resonates with me every time we talk about this work. And he said, just promise me one thing, we're not going to treat people as numbers. Um, the state's role in this and my role in this, John, is um, building consensus around what that actually means. Right. So when we talk about wraparound services and models, right, um, defining what is the problem we're actually trying to solve. I was at the ag convention a couple of weeks ago and I said the problem we're not trying to solve for is how do we feed poor people? Right. The state's role in this is figuring out the problem we're actually trying to solve for, which is here is Jersey's food and here's all the families that need it. How do we build an equitable system in the middle that makes sense for everybody? Right. And part of our role, if I may, John, is really emphasizing through my office that um, true food security, this definition of true food security that we're using, right? The true food security exists when all people, all of us at all times have economic, social, and physical access to safe, sufficient, nutritious food for um, food for both dietary and cultural mm -hmm. preferences for an active and healthy lifestyle, getting as many people to agree on that and to inform their strategies around that. And then part of our role is also, you know, taking the burden off of Elizabeth's team and some of the, the folks that I see commenting in the chat, their teams, but what does this data look like? Gathering all the publicly available data, looking at the data and filling in the gaps so that we know what's working, what's not working, what can we improve, what can we strategically invest in, right? The state's role in that is, is making all of that information available to all of us and giving all of, all of us a platform to come together so we can do what my boss said, move the needle on food security. Do you also have, um, are you at the table in terms of determining the state's investment in terms of dollars? Often this, these things come down to dollars. Yes, sir. Um, and you know, is, has the has the legislature under Coughlin, you know, walked the walk as well as you know talking the talk on this as well as the governor? I mean, you 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 talk to him about this. Is it in the budget? We're also in budget season, by the way. So <laughs> be careful what you say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, well, you know, and, and talk about that, Elizabeth, as well. I mean, resources matter, uh, no doubt. Yeah, Mark, do you want to go first or do you want me to? Uh, I guess whoever I guess. wants to go first. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think New Jersey is unprecedented compared to other states. So I think they do walk the walk, absolutely, and, and that they really have you know made funds available and stuck to that in order for us to be able to not only get food to our networks, but those infrastructure advancements that I was talking about. So what you know, our government funding goes to yes to buying a lot of food um, to get out to the pantries and to the network, but also to giving grants to many of our partners to get them refrigeration or hand trucks or the things that they need to be able to serve these increasing numbers. Um, and also on the SNAP side, you know, New Jersey has, um, if not the highest still, the, one of the highest um, SNAP allotments for families. And that that is really a game changer. Getting more people on SNAP is to us one of the biggest ways to, to move the needle, um, to make sure that there's a sustainable source for people um, to pick, be able to pick their own food also. Yeah. And I'll say I agree with Elizabeth. I, I mean, when I was in Philadelphia uh, on Monday talking about New Jersey's food security work, I outlined for the group um what the governor's office, um, you know, 
and I talk about in terms of investments and innovation and what the speaker and I talk about. And everybody in that room was saying, I wish we were New Jersey. And I said, <laughs> I said, I'm here so that you can learn from us. Right. I think we are unprecedented. Um, I've had multiple states reach out to say, tell us about how you're doing food security work. I will also say, John, I think one of the most exciting things for me is that philanth philanthropy has also stepped up. Right. We in New Jersey have one of the things that makes us unique is we have two food security funds that are talking to each other and working together and working with my office about uh, innovation and strategic investments. And there's actually a large national fund that caught wind of all of this and reached out and said, how do we work with you and your two um, philanthropic funds in New, in New Jersey? I think that's such an important point because it really is, you know, it sounds cliche, but it really is going to take everyone to, to attack this problem. So it is philanthropy, it's corporate support. I mean, the teams who come here and volunteer and donate are a huge part of our infrastructure. And then, of course, government um, and, and nonprofits all working together um, is really the only way we're going to make be able to move the needle. Several folks have asked about college students. Um, talk specifically about serving that. I don't know if uh, one question was, do we have a percentage of food insecure college students? I don't know if you're- It's, it's very you're, high. It's about, about one in three college students. It says that they're food insecure at some point in their college career. Um, we do work with a number of pantry partners. I was actually just at one of the Rutgers Newark pantries on Wednesday. Um, and they're really working very hard with different models too for students. You know, So they have like food lockers outside so that are refrigerated so that if somebody's in class all day or working or something, but still needs food, they're going to be able to get access to it. I think our college pantries are really doing an incredible job trying to to meet those needs um, in a holistic way. Yeah, Again, and I- what the state can do? Sorry, John, what? Again, is there more the state can do on this? I mean, we've we've heard, you know, certainly out of the pandemic, but since as well. Yeah, so my office is actually in communication with the Office of, uh, of Higher Education, the Secretary of Higher Education. We're troubleshooting and brainstorming ideas that we can do uh, there. I will say that college hunger is real. Um, I was when I was at Cumac, I was working at um, I was working with William Patterson on a lot of this in December. I'll actually when you asked John about college hunger, I made a statement at a conference because a college student asked, what are you guys going to do for us? Um, I my encouragement to all universities and colleges that want to build pantries is to build cafes, not closets. Right. So I think one thing to really note if we're when we're talking about college hunger, um, you know, my alma mater, I went I went. Um, so shout out, shout out to the Hawk's Nest. Um, they've <laughs> built a trauma informed community driven environment where there's no shame and there's no stigma, right? Imagine being, imagine being a kid. You're a kid, man. You're a kid and you're trying to learn because you're trying to get there, right? Yeah. The last thing you need, and this goes for our parents as well. The last thing you need is a reminder that you're struggling. So we have to create spaces, trauma informed community driven spaces where people feel empowered, right? To get there. And so part of my role, and when when everybody that's asking in the chat, what's the state's role in this? It's me advocating for our families on your behalf so that we can build better systems and better models, more trauma-informed spaces. And then I can go in and advocate on both sides, right? In the executive branch, in the legislature for what you guys are saying and what you guys say our families and our college students need. Is stigma still a, a big challenge barrier you know talk a little bit about that <laughs> well i will it my, is, but, i'm sorry <laughs> you know, i think it's yeah. our job to make it not i think a lot of our you know treating people with dignity and respect are something i think our partners do very well but it is always something that we have to come back to and actually to, to mark's point in the colleges you know it Rutgers, Hend, um, who runs the Rutgers Newark Pantry, was telling me that they someone wanted to kind of tuck it away downstairs because to you know to make so people wouldn't be ashamed to go there. And she said, no, it's the opposite. It should be part of the community, like that. It is a cafe and you know a place where people can also then pick up some things to take home. But where some students might come to volunteer, others, she said, for the first time, people would bring a friend, which means they they weren't embarrassed to tell somebody that they needed this help and they were able to come. And I think it's just so important um, that people feel you know that understood and seen and that this is not, there's nothing wrong with needing some help, especially when you're in college and working and doing all these things at once, um, you know, who wouldn't need some assistance? Well, I, I think that that's borne out by uh, a fair bit of the reporting that I did for this story. I mean, it makes it makes me think of, I mean, going back to the lady, the uh, the middle school math teacher in, um, in Merchantville, 
<clears throat> and I, I and I said to her something like, well, we, we, you know, she hadn't previously been to a food pantry. And I said, well, you know, did you did that worry you? Did that make you feel any sort of sense of shame or stigma associated with this? And she said, no, it, it, to her, it felt like a blessing. Uh, mm. That it that it was there, um, and uh, and I heard a similar thing from uh, from one of the other clients at that pantry, uh, and and she said, well, you know, if you need the help, come and get it, and people are not going to judge you for coming to get it. But one of the things I've covered education for a long time in New Jersey, and certainly know the the uh, struggles with school lunch, and for a long time, New Jersey had a horrible record on school lunch, um, and and it is gone a long way since um and sigma was still a factor in that and and um and i think there's now some conversations of expanding school lunch further um and in terms of percentages with uh, uh, senator ruiz has talked about it being universal at some point um which would cost a lot of money um but obviously would reach a lot of kids you know talk about the school's role uh and and where they fit into this puzzle of of, of work mark i mean uh, certainly the state contributes to that as well. I have a very dear friend who once said to me, um, it was in the throes of the pandemic, actually. She said, I have long believed that our schools could be major hubs for social determinants of health, right? Because this is where our children are. This is where we know our children are. And we we know that they're going to go here and they're going to grow here. Um, and we need to strategically look at how we can help our schools so that we can change environment, so we can change behavior, right? How can we make, uh, one of Elizabeth's uh, colleagues, Bernie, his team is making amazing uh, progress in terms of creating choice marketplace at schools. One of the things that my team and I were looking at um, you know, before I took office, um, is how do we create food pharmacies um, in schools? And this is the time to do it, right? While it's this administration and this speaker and there's this momentum and nationally our state is being referenced as as a leader, as you, you both, John and John, um, clearly pointed out, momentum is a powerful carrier um, of programming of investment of strategy, right? So, and how can we do that in schools? And we're actually on a project, um, you know, working with Rutgers on this um, to gather a lot of that. And a lot of you will hear me say data, data, data a lot. I have a, I have a rule, if within the first hour of a meeting that I show up at, you haven't told me what problem we're trying to solve and how we're trying to solve it, I probably won't come back to that meeting. <laughs> and and we can't answer those questions until we actually have good data that we have partnered with community to get, right? So, I mean, that's just, just why I'm audaciously unapologetic about gathering a lot of that and using this office to gather as much of that as possible to give to Elizabeth and her team and to the folks on this call so we can strategize, especially with schools. Would universal access in schools make a significant, I would think it may, would make a huge difference. Um, you know, I, I don't know where, where our numbers are now, um, but you know, is, is that, and is it, is it feasible? I mean, is it something that, that or realistic politically uh, given the price tag? I'm curious what you think from, from inside the, the system. Yeah, I was wondering if that was for me or was that for yeah, those? It was know. probably for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some states do it. I will say that. Right, they've been able so, to do it. Yeah. So he, here's what here's what I'll uh, here's what I'll say to to everybody and to, to answer that, John, because this I was literally asked this again. Thank you, Philadelphia, for asking me all these very hard questions <laughs> on Monday. It was probably because you all knew I was doing this one today. Um, I will say this: I don't think. I know I have not met anybody, especially since I've taken office in September of 2022. I have not met anybody who disagrees with the idea that every um, child in New Jersey should have access to healthy meals, right? And if if you disagree with me on that, I'm kind of like, well, I'm probably not going to your meeting again, right? <laughs> but the charge to me, and I agree with this, and it's my role and my responsibility to give us as a state enough information to decide what that looks like. Because some of the states that have passed it 
are actually having to roll back, right? Because they didn't have enough information to start. So I will not have done my job for this state if I have not given us enough information and strategy. And actually one of the bills that was signed um, in January instructs me to draft a lot of this stuff. Um, I will not have done my job properly if I have not given um, the state, the three of you, everybody on this call, um, that kind of information. Here's, we have a question. This is an interesting one. Uh, uh, what can the state do to combat greedflation by large corporations that own a majority of the modern- Greedflation? Uh, wow. But obviously there's been a, you know, inflation is a huge factor in this. But I mean, <laughs> the question here is how is this being addressed when we when it comes to food insecurity? John or Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm I, can, I, I will happily jump uh, into that uh, one. I should, I should I should say, jump in. <laughs> um, so I am a big fan of um, strengths-based language and giving everybody every opportunity to engage with us and giving everybody every opportunity to disappoint us, right? So I get the term, I suppose, greedflation, but I will, <laughs> greedflation, um, I will say, I think my personal opinion, the best way to combat greedflation, especially if we're talking about um, corporate folks uh, and corporations is to invite them into the conversation to co-create and collaborate, right? And go where the energy's at, right? When you go to corporations, don't ask them for their money, ask them for their partnership and ask them for their investment, right? Because you will meet the people in the corporate sector because this is how I did it at Kumac. Right. You'll meet the people who are like, I want to invest in this and I want to be a partner in this. And I had a rule. I would not take a check from somebody that wouldn't come to my facility and wouldn't talk to my people. Right. That's how I personally think we combat greedflation. Right. It doesn't do anything for the larger picture. Right. <laughs> Where money is still money and cash is king and all and all of that. And I'm smart enough to know that what I'm saying just now was not going to make immediate change over here. But in this time of opportunity, can you come at it from here and get enough of the folks in the corporate sector to be our partners? And I do want to give a lot of our corporate partners credit because we really do get incredible donations of, you know, from the supermarkets and the, the food that we get, but also financial 100%. and people who volunteer. And like there's a very generous corporate culture here, you know, not not denying that there's greedflation also. But <laughs> I do want to make sure we recognize just how much people, companies in New Jersey do help. Is there a book on that? Should we find out? <laughs> I'm guessing it must have come come from somewhere. <laughs> I think I I had asked John um, in his reporting to to look at what you know is happening in on the commercial uh, food distribution system. Are there lessons from the private sector um, for you know? Um, and and you did some reporting on that, John. Well, I I mean the point that was made by. Uh, by Shelley Skinner of the Tapper Foundation, obviously uh, one of the the big uh, uh, philanthropies that uh, that have given increasing amounts of um, uh, of money to, uh, to to combat food insecurity. So, I mean, the, the one of the points she made was that uh, that the food distribution s uh, system in New Jersey, the food aid system, um, has a way to go to catch up with the uh with the the commercial food system uh and and i her her argument is that um that the food aid system should adopt some of those practice some of the practices or perhaps some of the technology that has enabled uh the big supermarket chains or, or perhaps amazon you know uh to to uh uh you know perfect the art of distribution uh a distribution writ large and and presumably uh to uh, to apply that to the food uh to to the food aid business uh and in which case um it would it would achieve a, the great a greater efficiency the greater efficiency that that elizabeth was talking about earlier and john you know that's a great point and and i'll agree with it um, I have a meeting in two weeks on predictive analytics, AI innovation, and global insights, right, with the corporate sector. Um, and actually, I'm on a farm 
next next week um, with some folks with that background, supply chain and logistics, right? So that as part of the data gathering, we can learn mm -hmm. what what is what are those best practices over there? And during this time of innovation and opportunity, how can we bring that over? How can I bring that to the economic uh, mobility, commerce, and agriculture um, assembly committee, right? How can I br bring that to the the governor's office. There are 100% um, best practices uh, within the corporate sector and partners in the corporate sector that want to give their time and their investment and their innovation um, to New Jersey to be a part of this work. And that's what that's a great example of what it looks like um, to combat the negative through partnership and invitation to engage. Yeah, and I just want to, and some of that is happening. I think it just has to happen, first of all, faster and on a larger scale. I think, you know, some pantries, Correct. people do order online, like they, you know, and they can, or at least make an appointment online, but other places, they literally place an order for their food online. There is some of that. And we have been working. I totally agree with Mark. There's a lot of people in the private sector who want to help. We were actually at a, dist a distribution place the other day at their warehouse to see how they do different things. And um, it's really helpful. And they want to help. They're going to you know, loan us some, an executive, really help us look at our food distribution from what they've learned. So I 100% agree with Shelly on that point and think we, we can work together to make a lot of that happen. Yeah, I'm curious. You you said you were at a warehouse. What, what was it like? Were they doing things very different than... Than you do? Um, it was, this, this was a um, beverage. It's Peerless, which is a be beverage distribution. Um, you know, some things were different. Um, I think they had some efficiencies that we don't have, some things that, you know, some lessons we learned and then some that they learned, you know, that it's a really, it's a good exchange, but they're a wonderful supporter of ours and have definitely committed to sort of helping us look at our network and how we can improve our efficiency. John, do you want to say something? Oh, no, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, John, one, if, one if I may. Things, well, go ahead, Mark. Uh, it's actually from the chat. It just popped up. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't help but uh, yeah, see yeah. that it had popped up. Um, there was a there was a question about collaboration with the environmental sector, um, and I I just wanted to uh, to lift up and acknowledge that the food security work that and that definition that I mentioned. One of the major pillars. There's six dimensions that have to you have to be working on in unison, and uh, one of the pillars is uh, sustainability. So that involves climate change. Um, food waste. So it's 100% to the person who asked it in the chat. Um, if we're not talking about that, if we're not collaborating in that sector, which we are to answer your question, um, it's then we are then we are missing an opportunity in true food security work. Yeah, and the more efficient we get, and the more we do go to choice, those things all feed into, you know, the food reducing food waste. So great question. Yeah, one also was asking, how do you Get these get this information out to folks. Um, you know the challenge of just communicating some of these things, and and I I know this happens in schools as well. Um, you know, it, is that the state's role? Is it your role, uh, community food bank? I mean, we're 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 is it our role in the media uh, as well? Yeah. And I think that we we bear some of that as well. But but where can folks go to get? I mean, I you know this is a, a plug for each of your organizations. Um, but where can folks go to get more information on this? Somebody was also asking for some data uh, as they're doing it. It sounds like a college capstone. Um, you know, where 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 can they go? And and we will provide uh, we can provide some of these links as well. But talk us through them as well. Elizabeth, you want to take that first, and then I'll jump in. Sure. Um, you know, the Feeding America website has a lot of data, a lot of resources. Our website, cfbnj.org, has some. Um, the USDA website. Um, there's a lot about SNAP and, and about nutrition on those sites. So I think those are all good places. In answer to your question of whose job is it, I think it's all of our job. <laughs> and uh, raising awareness is a big thing. We actually today, we're, we're going through a 24-hour packathon. We have volunteers here for 24 hours. So even, you know, there's people doing the 1.30 a.m. shift, the 4.30 a.m. shift. A lot of that is to raise awareness because, you know, when you have a story like that, CBS News was here this morning. We have radio stations here, um, really just to get the word out about how important it is. Yes, you can volunteer any day, but that's not a news story. So we had to have some reason to get the news people here and uh, it, it worked. So I think getting the word out of just how everybody can really help and contribute to solving this problem. And, you, you know, I, I heard, let me quickly ask on volunteers, are those numbers as strong as, as, as ever, uh, or is the pandemic passing? Has that, you know, maybe lessened it at all? Uh, Cause I they know that's a huge resource. Yeah. 
they've bounced back a lot. They're probably slightly below pre-pandemic, but we're in very good shape. I mean, we had about 88,000 volunteer hours in the last year, which is about 42 full-time staff, the equivalent of like 42 people. Um, so that's pretty amazing. We couldn't do what we do without our volunteers. And I wanted to, um, you know, acknowledge what Elizabeth said when you asked John, like, whose job is it to tell the story? Dr. Jenny, who heads up research and eval for my team, says it all the time when we talk about food security, we're talking about all of us. So it, I acknowledge what Elizabeth said. It's all of our job. And then, John, it is, yes, part of uh, my team and I view it as part of our role. Uh, to give access to this data, to make data not scary. So by the end of this month, um, our website will launch. Um, and then part of that website, we are creating uh, lit reviews and data charts so that people can openly access everything that we've gleaned. We, ha we have research projects, but also we've been hard at work trying to um, glean as much of the publicly available data as possible and consolidate it in a way so that people can see their work and their roles within these six dimensions of food security. And people by the end of this month when our website launches will have access to um, a lot of this a lot of this information and they can reach out to our office, you know, for collaboration. Saw somebody talking about schools, 100% uh, working with all the stakeholders that are working in schools, NJ ASBO, School Nutrition Association. Um, I was very clear with Governor Murphy, I'm not doing this job from a desk in Trenton. So um, I'm putting a lot of miles on my car for uh, for this so that we're out in community as much as we can be. And as mentioned, as you know, the media does play a role. John, you play a role in this, John Hurdle. Um, I, I know I, you're- I hope so. Yeah, I know you're thinking of future stories because um, one of the part of the project, uh, the change project in general, is is us not just writing a story and moving on to the next story, but um, you know, raising questions out and looking at the challenges and the barriers and and getting those conversations going. And and so you will uh, be seeing more from us on this. Um, I, I want to thank uh, very much um, Elizabeth and and Mark and John for joining us today. Um, this was taped, and so we will be providing it uh, to. We had a, a great crowd, um, and we'll be providing it to those who joined, as well as even those who registered in the next couple of days. Uh, John Hurdle has done some interviews with with um, with our broadcast brethren that bring some more information to it, and we also in the project uh, uh, invite folks to tell us their story um, and. You know some of the the barriers they faced, and also some of the opportunities. We'd we'd love to hear folks' stories, so please, you know, circulate that to those who might uh, will be willing to talk about it, and and we'll find some ways to to promote those stories and 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 maybe bring them into the conversation as well. But uh, this has been a great conversation, and and I really appreciate all joining us. Um, you know, keep up the keep up the work, all of you. Obviously, uh, the the needs are are enormous and 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 sadly growing. Um, and uh, you know, let's let's do this conversation again sometime uh, as as we learn more because it's really we're at a place where we're learning all the time, uh, including as journalists. So thank you all very much. Thanks everybody for joining us uh, today. Um, hopefully, everyone is safe and sound out there. Uh, in this peril, you know, in, in with earthquakes around us, and um, what a crazy day! It is a crazy day, <laughs> indeed. but uh, and also the weather the weather is getting better as well. So um, feeling at least good about that. Uh, enjoy your weekends, and um, we hope to see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much, Johns. Thank you, Johns. <laughs> <laughs>